So I want to welcome everyone back to another live event. I know we've been doing these about once a month, so we're trying to do them a little bit more frequently. We've got some awesome guests here today for you guys. And today's the title of today's presentation is Make Your Practice More Profitable. Before we jump into the presentation, just have a few quick announcements. Uh, first announcement, we've got quite a few new partners uh, this next half year of Odie's on Finance. Every about six months, we renew our, renew our partnerships. So we got a lot of familiar faces. I just want to list out our new ones, just so you're familiar. First one is Carl and Associates. They're a CPA firm based out of Washington, and they specialize in ODs and optometrists. Next is Housing Company. You might remember their live event from last month. They're also a CPA group based out of Utah, and they once again specialize in doctors and small businesses. Uh, next, we have Bankers Health Group, BHG, and they give out business capital loans. So definitely check out our website if you're interested in getting a loan for your practice. And Integrated Wealth Management, that is Adam Schmela. You might have remembered him. Uh, he did the CARES Act presentation a couple months back, and he is a CFP. And finally, we have Hayes Wealth Advisors. That is Natalie Hayes, and she is a CFP as well. And both of them specialize in optometry. Nice. And just a couple more announcements. Uh, make sure to visit the website, odysonfinance.com. There's a lot of new articles up there. You can subscribe to the newsletter. You'll get hit with a little pop-up whenever you go on the new on the website so you can subscribe through that and also make sure to follow the instagram odies on finance and then subscribe to the youtube and podcast just search odies on finance and you can watch all the videos like this one all right so let me introduce our guest from today really excited we got the I entrepreneur team on today and that's dr raymond brill and his son perry brill and i'm just going to run through a quick bio on dr raymond brill first so Dr. Brill graduated cum laude from Illinois College of Optometry in 1978 with BSBS and OD degrees after completing undergraduate stu studies at Northern Illinois University. He received a scholarship from the Illinois Optometric Association and a U.S. Army Health Profession Scholarship. Dr. Brill served as a division optometrist at Fort Riley, Kansas for four years, leaving the service with the rank of captain in 1982. After spending a year in a pediatric ophthalmology practice doing exams under anesthesia and infant aphagic contact lens fitting, Dr. Brill began his own practice in 1983 called Brill, Brill Eye Center in Mission, Kansas. He is an early adopter of technology and his practice is diverse with an emphasis on specialty contact lenses, anterior segment disease, and luxury eyewear. He presents COPE lectures on dry eye disease, amniotic membrane use, and practice management topics. He has served the community and the profession on various boards and currently is on the advisory committee of the Gas Permeable Lens Institute and is a question reviewer for the American Board of Optometry. In 2010, Dr. Brill earned an executive MBA degree with top honors from the Block School of Management in Kansas City with emphasis in innovation and entrepreneurship and was appointed to the Beta Gamma Sigma International Honor Business Fraternity. Dr. Brill is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry the Orthokeratology Academy of America, and, the dip and a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry. Dr. Brill is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Missouri-St. Louis College of Optometry and offers an externship site for specialty care. So welcome, Dr. Brill. Wow, that sounds like a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, I, I, I got these bios in my email so what, morning, that really so. <laughs> what that really means is I'm just old, okay? That's what it really means. <laughs> I think there's a lot of good stuff in that. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> you're you're quite the overachiever. <laughs> you know, they stop. They said stop getting diplomates, fellows, because my card is just not long enough. Have that's to, yeah, you're gonna long. have to get like a double business card or something like yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And next, let me introduce uh, his son, Perry Brill. So Perry is the CEO of iRocket and also the co-CEO of iTrepreneur Media. And Perry is proud to be a representative of the elusive millennial mind, which everybody is trying to figure out when it comes to eye care and eyewear. While working on a BS in environmental studies at the University of Kansas, Perry took on an opticianry job at a local practice. That's when the optical bug bit. SUNY was given the practice advice on how to be more efficient. Since 2014, Perry has been the manager of his dad's Brill Eye Center practice in Mission, Kansas. Perry, alongside with his father, co-founded Entrepreneur Media, a news and educational platform through podcasting, video creation, blogging, and social media. It's focused on helping practices grow through a positive mindset, access to digital tools, and a plethora of business ideas for optometrists and opticians to implement in their own practice. In January of 2020, Perry launched iRocket Consulting, a growth-based consulting agency focused on rapid implementation of ideas to help optometrists 
make money and find missing cash flow opportunities. Perry believes that any practice can be great if they want to actually put in the work, listen, and execute. So welcome, Perry. Thank you for having me here. All right. Well, I'm just jump... being interviewed, you know? So yeah, it's, it's <laughs> the tables are turned a little bit. <laughs> start asking you a bunch of questions. Say, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> well, let's just jump right into it. I mean, if you guys, I mean, you run iTrimmerner and you talk about this all the time. Can you just give us a current state of private practice and private practice profitability? What are we looking at in this day and age? Perry, you want to go first? Yeah, you know, I, I guess we have a little different viewpoint since we are almost a 40 year practice. You know, we have stability and things don't affect us as much. Um, some of that is luck, some of it's hard work. Um, you know, the community we're in, but we're definitely right now, we are a lot more profitable this in June this year than last year. Uh, we don't know if it's because people are excited to get out there and, and shop and see humans again, or um, maybe our marketing is just working. What's your thoughts, Dr. Brill? Um, you know, I don't know, but I love it when I say, can I get glasses too? So after, after buying a year's supply of contacts, so it's kind of like, okay, what's going on? You know, where's the candid camera? But I think um, it's really all about the experience. And we try to have, try to always give the patient a nice experience. And after listening to all those AOA webinars and all the webinars that say, treat people, like, treat, essentially treat people like dirt, keep them in the car, don't be nice to them. Tell them a call if you could come in. I don't think you could come in. Okay, come in, wear a mask. Do, you know, it's all kind of dictatorial. I thought none of that's going to be a nice experience. Now, patients are, they are um, experiencing it in other, other medical practices, up, so they're used to it. But I thought, can we make it just a little bit nicer and, uh, and maybe kind of demote COVID to the whole experience? You know, let's just make it a nice, fast experience give them really good uh, professional care and a warm, friendly atmosphere. So, so that's what we've done. We've kind of, we all are mat, wear our masks and, mm -hmm. you know, te cut, te um, um, do the temperature, but we don't play it all. So, you know, uh, I think, you know, this is really the greatest time to be an optometrist. Um, while there's a lot of downward pressure and we've seen uh, news from managed care uh, in the past two months of, you know, declining reimbursements, steering us to use certain products, we have the choice to, to change. And I think during COVID, we saw all these crazy digital tools come out and these tools have existed, but finally people are thinking, wow, I need an online contact lens store. Uh, I need better sales tools. Um, I need e-commerce. And so I think now is the time where you can really create a profitable practice scale and do it all pretty affordable. You just have to spend a little money and be focused. So, so I think the, the general key is I, I, I've always operated um, kind of as a startup. You know, thinking we're just a startup. I'm not a not a 42 year practice. I'm I'm a startup. So we always have to do things better. And when I um, built my practice, right across the street was an optical named Superior Optical. People would come out in front and say, "Yeah, I see great." superior optical company so they'd be reading a sign across the street of course and then we had uh we had an optical that was there for like 40 years like a block down the street and uh and then another optometrist like half a block away and then i thought you know it really helps to be naive when you do a lot of stuff because you wouldn't really <laughs> you wouldn't do half the things you'd say that's pretty stupid to open up where everybody is but you know mcdonald's and burger king do that all the time though and MDs do it all the time. They they don't mind locating right next to another right next to another ophthalmologist. So um, so sometimes it's a little bit of luck, but sometimes you you have to be uh, thinking really ahead, you know. And if you think always like a like an entrepreneur or like an entrepreneur, so if you always think ahead like that and think like a startup, um, you'll always be ahead. And you know, our goal was really to be like five years ahead of everybody. So I think. Yeah, you, you nailed it. Early adoption is really important. Um, just like you, Dr. Neufeld, when PPP came out, you were, you were way ahead of the curve. I mean, you had the information at the forefront and that's what we need to be in optometry. Um, don't pay attention to people online who are the naysayers or are negative or, um, you know, focus on those people who are really happy and offering suggestions and, um, you know, seek out a, kind of a mentor. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that completely. I mean, I, 
I took over an existing practice that had been around for 40 years, but we're always thinking as a startup, I'm definitely on board with that. Always thinking early adopting different things like that. Yeah. And so, so we want to be different. You know, I, I try to ask uh, colleagues when they ask me, well, what should I do? I'm thinking like, okay, first give me like, write down 10 reasons the patient should come to you. Why come to you instead of the other person down the street? And they usually say, well, I take, insurance and I work Saturdays and I take credit cards and we're nice. I'm like, okay, everybody's nice. They all take credit cards and they all, they all work hard. So why specifically? And, and if you can't answer that question, why would anybody else come to you? I mean, you really should have your unique selling proposition, your USP and, and it should be forefront and your employees should know it. Cause when they're talking on the phone, um, you know, they really should know why to come to you and they should know, you should know some background. Uh, and it shouldn't be like a sales pitch. It should be like from the heart. So, um, so, so I think being an early adopter and try to be try to be better. Essentially, try to be better, be different, be efficient. Uh, nowadays, respect the whole COVID thing. So our patients are noticing that we are uh, having masks on, and that we're we're cleaning the frames and doing doing all this stuff. So, um, so if you are uh, being better, maybe. Uh, try different things and try to be open-minded. I've generally been a little close-minded on the annual supply because I thought it was a little bit like cash for clunkers. You know, I'll, I'll sell, I'll do the exam. We do a management fee. And then if I sell them a year's worth of lenses, they will, uh, they'll just not come back. But uh, so now we're, we've actually gotten better on our annual supplies. Uh, and uh, we've used this product called LensQuote, L-E-N-S, uh, Q-U-O-T-E, lensquote.net. And uh, I don't know if Ryan is on here. Ryan Gustis, he's a, he's a very entrepreneurial uh, young OT. And uh, it's, it's something that the staff does either on an iPad or in the office, uh, on the office computer. Well, let's show them uh, how to explain how much their lenses are, either six months or a year, if there's a rebate and how much your insurance costs. It was very hard for us to explain on a, on a paper form. And I think that's something people need to see. So that's, that's helped out a lot. Um, yeah, I think nothing, I think what COVID really taught us is we need systems in the practice. So um, I'm sure you, Dr. Neufeld, when you came back to work, you probably had a meeting with staff and said, here's how you're going to spray things down and oh, yeah. wear your mask, <laughs> you know, don't hang it on one ear. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, my, my dad taught me this is that business have, Businesses have systems and systems run the business. Mm -hmm. So just like cleaning protocols, you have to walk in every day and the business should really be able to run itself and lean. And you, whether it's payroll or bookkeeping or keeping track of lab, lab invoices, everything um, needs a system. And if you walk into work every day with chaos and scrambling, you know, how can you be profitable? You don't even know what you're paying yeah. for, for cost of goods. Oh, definitely. You have to yeah. kind of be in charge there. So we, we've we done care credit for like a really long time. And it's always onerous because people didn't want you to know their personal stuff. And, you know, they're afraid to get a hit on their on their credit report. And a lot of times these are people at marg marginal credit. And, I, you know, if care credit didn't want to finance them, I certainly don't want to. But now we did something called Sunbit. And um, we, I don't want to, I'm not promoting, but we did a webinar on it. So you can look on Entrepreneur. Where would it be, Per, on YouTube or on just the iTrue website? There's a blog about um, patient financing. So, yeah, I think and that's made it real easy. Scan their, their driver's license. And in, in really just a few seconds, it tells us how much credit um, they can get. And um, so they have a, a, a nicer system. So, you know, we're kind of done with care credit unless they already have it. And, and it's been out there for a long time. So somebody finally... Uh, obsoleted them, I think. But yeah. so we got to be be efficient, um, and essentially you want to great create a great experience. So I I think that's really a key. I think so you want people to return. The bottom line is you want them to return and refer others. If you think everything through that through that sense, like how will this get people to return and refer others? And mm -hmm. if employees complain about things, you think like, how does this affect the practice? Okay, I know you have a personal problem, but how does this really affect the practice? And I. I think that's a good way to answer a lot of their concerns or if they're, I don't know, just all sorts of things that come up with employees. And uh, you have to be thinking, okay, how does it affect the practice? And when they think like that, it, usually the answer is pretty evident, so. Great, great. 
I want to touch on one thing before we jump into the okay. questions. You mentioned systems, and since that's something that I really like too. It's something that we've implemented in our practice and really prescribed to the EMA, the EMF method. If you guys have ever read that book, I'm sure yeah. you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where you have the handbook and you just lay everything out. So it runs like clockwork and you can leave your practice and it can still run. So can you just touch on how you guys have set up your systems just before we jump into these questions just to enlighten the group? Um, yeah. So, you know, we're broken into a few different small business units. Uh, it sounds weird, you know, for like a nine or 10 person practice, we still have different little units within the practice. We have mm -hmm. optical, we have teching, front desk, billing, um, you know, and of course we have overlap between some staff members. And lab. And lab. Um, so let me just give you one example. You know, a major decrease in profits for practices is not keeping track of credit memos. Um, that goes for contact lenses that you return to your distributor. That goes for scratch warranties for lenses, uh, and that goes for frame defect returns. So, um, you know, I simply, I have a, what's called a, a lens, lens credit tracker. It's an Excel sheet. And we, we put down the tracking numbers, who sent it, when you sent it, when we expect the credit to be due, and we reconcile. And that spreadsheet is shared on our server. So at any time, I could be in Zimbabwe, and I could check in with my opticians and say, hey, where's the credit? Um, so, you know, that's a, you, you I, I could go to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, I guess. Okay. Um, so that's one example of mm -hmm. just having a system. Yeah. And I, I think anything that we can outsource um, and automate is better. So uh, things that are, that took a lot of time are, you know, filing insurance. So if you can outsource to uh, a company that, that files insurance and does your revenue cycle management, that's good. Um, Payroll, I remember I used to do payroll a long time ago and, and it was my Gateway 2000 computer went out and I thought, I'm never gonna do payroll again. I'm gonna go to a payroll service. So, cause you just never know and this is too stressful and you wanna have something, you wanna really know, okay, can somebody do it? And you know, maybe your parents can do it if they're CPAs, right Aaron? Yeah, so, yeah in my case, yeah. You know, <laughs> parents CPAs, I mean, you gotta count on somebody and and it's actually hard to keep up with that because you don't get all the rules and the mm -hmm. CPAs get it. And, and I think the government knows that paychecks or sure pay, whoever you use, they're not going to cheat on your benefit. I mean, that's mm -hmm. so, you know, that, so that works well. Um, and then I, I think one, one of the things that's helpful is, is trying to make it convenient for your patients. You know, we do a lot of dry eye work and I could say, oh no, we don't sell vitamins. We don't sell a lot of stuff. You got to go other places but they want a one-stop shop. I mean, so I have somebody come in uh, from three hours away from Wichita for uh, dry eye workup and she got Lipiflow and Blefax. She was there to buy all the stuff. I mean, she don't want to start going around. She was a wealthier woman. She doesn't want to go around. Make it easy for them to do business with you. And they're happy to, I don't want to run around. And every time you go to Target or Walmart and, and buy an optical product, they start, they're, you're out, they're marketing to you right away. So you're getting coupons. And so you might not think it's a long-term process, but they're, once they have your uh, information, they're gonna be marketing to you. Yeah, yeah, one, I think as far as systems go, um, when you find gaps in your practice, maybe it's some inefficiency of, uh, let's say the patient gets to the front desk and nobody knows what the fees are. You know, that's a gap and then you need to write down the gap and a mitigation plan for that. I know it sounds really corporate speak and stuff, and I, I totally hate the whole corporate thing, but um, there's a system for that. And maybe it's a, a messaging tool that you need to use within your office, Slack or Microsoft Teams. And, you know, that's a system, you know, transferring the billing codes and stuff. Yeah, yeah so I, I think in general, <clears throat> ODs, uh, at least in my generation, kind of went with the vow of poverty, you know, and, and in Kansas, we we started with Bosch Volunteer Optometric Services Humanity. And you know, a lot of people think they feel, they feel guilty about charging people for things. You know, I've, I've gone into practices and I, I said, well, you know, they're asking me, well, what, are, what should I charge for this? I said, what are you charging? Well, $4 for a tent, this for that. I said, well, why are you charging? Oh, cause that's on my lab. That's what the lab charges me. And like, no, 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 <laughs> you're, you're supposed to make a little money. You're supposed to stay in practice. Well, this doctor didn't stay in practice very long. He, he worked for an Indian health service, heck of a nice guy, but he felt guilty about trying to make money. And I think, you know, we're still in the capitalist system in the U.S. for a little while anyway. 
and we are supposed to try to make money. And, you, and people are proud to go to a better practice that has better staff, better equipment, looks nice. So, it, so don't take the vow of poverty uh, and don't presume people don't have uh, money to buy what you're selling. We, I've learned that a long time ago. I had a lady that came in in a house, like a Judith, uh, like a Edith Bunker house dress from All in the Family. And she says, I want a Cartier and I want this and I think like, uh, okay. So, and she, we just said, okay, let's see how this goes. And she says, yeah, my son's on Wall Street and he's got his American Express black card. He's going to pay for it. I'm going to call him right now. So you cannot presume people have or don't have money or don't want to spend money. Just allow them to spend money in your office. Just allow them. So assume that they're there for a reason and, and we're not the cheapest in town and they already know who the cheapest in town is. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, some, there's always somebody cheaper and uh, at least advertised that way. So allow them to spend money in your practice, but then again, you have to have the products, right? Yeah, that's very true. All right. Well, yeah, let's go ahead and let's jump into the questions. And first of all, audience, if anyone has a question, feel free to just comment on the live event and I will ask it to the iTrepreneur team. I don't think we have any questions yet, but we'll take a look at that. So yeah, let's go ahead and get started with the first question. Uh, what are some common bottlenecks in the exam room and the optical when it comes to creating a profitable practice? And either one of you can chime in and tell us your thoughts. I, I would think of communications. You know, when I'm in that exam room, I have no idea what's going on outside the exam room. So, and, and I've got eight rooms. I use three, but I don't know at all. And uh, so, so we have to have some communication system. Um, right now we're using Microsoft Teams. Uh, we could send notes uh, through to any of the staff, what we need. Uh, we've had all sorts of, we have light systems. Um, we had all sorts of systems involving buzzers. I've spent a, a ton of money on all those and a lot of them got obsoleted just as time goes on. But we have to know what's going outside. So though, and some of them are just as simple as bringing it, you know, have one of the texts, bring in a note. I've got a scribe always next to me. So they bring in a note and, you know, and that might say that the next patient's ready or uh, speed it up or anything like yeah, that. I would say, I would say one of the biggest bottlenecks between exam room and optical is um, it's like an orchestra. It's like a dance, the whole optometry experience. So when the patient goes from the medical experience to the optical experience, there can't be any delay. The moment someone's sitting there stale, they're rotting in the exam room, um, they're becoming a pumpkin and they're getting tired. And so you got to kind of keep the energy up and the flow. And so right when the doctor is done with the exam, I mean, that optician, if you're doing a handoff, needs to be there in, you know, 30 to 60 seconds. And then all that, all of a sudden the patient's like, wow, this is impressive. Like they had this timed out perfectly. It's kind of like when you go to the Mexican restaurant and they bring out your burrito in like three minutes, you're like, it feels good that they're on time. Mm -hmm. No, they bring your chips out first, right? Yeah. Yeah. I got to so, the appetite. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, yeah, so I, I kind of, I'm an observer of other systems and there are some nice restaurants that um, I know it's just like clockwork. They seat you, someone's right there with a hot biscuit, uh, you know, then the, the waiter or waitress is there and there it's, you know, they rehearsed it. I mean, they really rehearsed it mm -hmm. and that's how it should be. It should be, uh, it should be just very seamless. So when I'm examining a patient and I go to the slit lamp, my, my, uh, scribe turns off the lights, hands me the 78 doctor lens or 98 doctor. They turn back on the lights. I mean, and I don't know if patients notice that, but I love it. It's like clockwork and it makes my life a lot easier. They're documenting things. I don't type anything. And, uh, so for me, that's a lot of fun. It should be orchestrated. You're doing this thousands of times a year and your staff should know exactly how, how you want it. And that tries it, that really eliminates a lot of the bottlenecks. So, um, and, and when, it, when the handoff comes in, uh, it's kind of nice. They already, they've already looked on, on, um, on teams what the patient needed and I try to do a nice smooth handoff. Now, I don't know if they're too busy or not, but we'd rather not hand off out of the exam room because I try to keep them as a patient uh, and the closer they get to the front desk, they become more into consumers and there's a sucking sound out the front door. So I don't like hearing that sucking sound. So we ought to, so, so one of the things that 
is always harder as a bottleneck is trying to get patients to follow through with my recommendations. You know, I go through everything usually two or three times and it may be that they need three pairs of glasses. It may be that they need uh, vitamins, um, try, to, try to get uh, the family referrals. You know, when we're talking about, well, you know, how many kids do you have? Have we checked them yet? Or, you know, well, oh, you've got a three-year-old. Well, we need to get them in. You know, we need to get them in. And you, you have to do that with, with a passion. They have to feel your passion and they have to kind of think you're always doing what's in their best interest because we always have to be doing what's in their best interest. Now, I think everything that's good for the practice is also good for the business, okay? So there are businesses, and I would say, let's say if you talk to an insurance person, they don't exactly always give you the best thing for you since this is an, invest, an investment to finance. You know, a lot of times they want you to do a whole life, and if you're young, you probably just need term, and that's cheap, but they don't make any money on it either. So, no. so everything that say- we ask them to spend money on, we can be honest about and earnest about that, this is really the best thing for them. Now, whether yeah. they want to spend the money or not, at least you've documented your recommendations. Right. Um, I different. think one of the uh, things I like in the optical exam room handoff is, you know, it's don't talk, do not talk about insurance, do not talk about money, um, really start the bonding experience. I think that's what we do really well in private practice. Um, we just talk about life. We talk about their vacation. It's, it's really about that patient and, you know, we all become therapists at some point during our, our job during the day and kind of give people life guidance. Because if you think about it, you know, a lot of people, we don't get out as much anymore. And going to the doctor is, it's an event, especially, um, you know, for the elderly. And so you could you tell know, they, they would have their hair fixed. You know, the old people still, a lot of times they come in, their hair is fixed. They're used to the traditional MD yeah. experience and they, they're wearing nicer clothes, not as much anymore, but um, it is an experience for them and they respect the professionals more. Uh, I hate being treated like a merchant and you know those patients, they're like, uh, you know, even when you're doing a refection, go back, do this first one. No, I don't like that one. Go to the first, you know, they will try to take over the exam. <laughs> I, don't, I don't particularly like that. And they're not nice about it. They could easily say, please, could you go back please? So I, I, I think we use as many courtesies as we can because because it's a little more formal experience. I think, mm-hmm. As we're trying to relate to them, we're actually doing a history throughout the whole exam. I don't think you have to ask them like 100 questions. You can ask some of them during the exam. Yep, so definitely. of course, yeah, we, document, we document everything like that. But. Just one last point that we could probably move on. Um, you know, one thing to get rid of a bottleneck is take control of the sale. And so what that means is simply sit the patient down in the chair. Uh, don't let them browse. Cause if you, you know, if you were to look at a frame display from 25 feet out, every frame looks black and square. Um, so until you sit, especially now during COVID, we, we don't want patients, you know, grabbing yeah, things and touching it. it. So saves, it saves time. You become the professional. And it kind of reminds me of when you used to go to the shoe store and they would tie your shoes. Like oh. it just felt good. I don't want to the bend down. Yeah. yeah. No, like they pick the shoes out. You put your foot up there and they have the shoe horn. Uh, yeah. I love the yep. shoe. And then yeah, we call it the Nordstrom you. experience at our office, but yeah, that's the way we do it too. And then yeah. Yeah, you're more organized and you're, you get a more streamlined sale. So yeah. I think the work. patients, yeah. they appreciate it too, because they're like, wow, I can relax. I can just sc- uh, yeah. browse Instagram and then 45 minutes, you know, I've got two pairs. Mm-hmm. Now they can, yeah, the, the patient we don't like is one that we got about 2,000 frames, maybe a little bit more. They look at the displays. No, nope, don't see anything I like. Don't see anything I like. No, nope, I don't see anything I like here. I think mean, he just went through 2,000. Yeah. How could you not see it? And then, and they probably ha- already have some plan to do something mm-hmm. somewhere else. But um, so, and sometimes they're, they're scared because in a nice looking office, when they walk through the door, you know, we want them to have a wow experience. But sometimes the wow is, wow, this is a really nice place. And I'm going to do everything here. It looks like I could really trust the people. But sometimes the wow is, wow, I'm out of here as soon as I can because mm-hmm. it's yeah, yeah, you know, it looks ex- it looks expensive here. Mm-hmm. And so we have to come how get their their trust mm-hmm. and say, look, if you want something fast, we have our own lab. If you want something super high end, w- w- we have all that. Or if you want something basic, and basic can be easy to explain by saying, well, look, we have a lot of contact lens wearers, and they just want basic pair of glasses. They want basic frame, basic lenses, and we'll make it so that we'll work within your budget. So uh, it doesn't have to be expensive, but
But usually people that want everything, you know, then complain about, okay, well now it's too expensive. So, right. but, um, so I'll be offering everything. And I think somewhere you're going to find, and I have patients that have never bought glasses for me. They always go to an optician afterward. And, and that's just fine too, because at least they're loyal for their exam. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I, and then don't, hammer, don't hammer them about, why aren't you buying them here? You, you should be buying them here. And so, I mean, you can nudge them a little bit. When they're buying, when their frame is like seven years old and they just bought it, so mm -hmm. you know, thick temples, small <laughs> B, B frames, and you're like, oh yeah, I want a progressive in that. And I'm like, no, it's only 28 millimeters. We can barely. <laughs> not gonna happen. It's not gonna work. So we have to yeah. get something else out. All right. Before we move on to the next question, we got a couple of audience questions. Okay. Uh, first one's from Scott Chamberlain. Uh, what was the name of the comparable company to Care Credit called Sunbit? Was it called Sunbit? Sunbit. Yeah. How do you Is spell there, that? You want to give a reference to that? Because we did a webinar on that. Yeah, I put the link in the comments. Uh, but if okay. you just go to itrepreneur.com, I actually just, I wrote a blog on it. Um, okay. But basically it's, it has, um, it approves, I think what, 90% of people, even with, even with low credit scores. And the whole ex experience is better because you scan someone's driver's license and instead of having the patient fill out their income and social and feel like you're interrogating them, you just scan their driver's license, enter the address, and then in 30 seconds, you have a credit decision. And it's a soft pull on credit versus a hard pull. So okay. you're never going to affect their credit scores, which is nice. Okay. Yeah, so if they wonder, just tell them you were, you, that you know the entrepreneur guys, Brills, and um, I don't know if they'll do anything extra. What are, are they doing anything for? Yeah, I think they let you try it out, right? They'll buy you a pizza. I'll tell you that. So oh, yeah, they'll buy you a pizza. Schedule a meeting <laughs> with them and they'll buy your whole staff pizza. Yeah, that's something. <laughs> yeah, so, but they were great to work with. Um, very easy. And their training was excellent. So they have a training system that was really, really good. Nobody can use it in the office until everybody's trained. So we like okay. that. Yeah, yeah. And got one more question for you guys before we move on. Uh, what vitamins do you recommend and keep for sale for patients with dry eye? So I try to be consistent on, on, on vitamins. I think if you're changing all the time, you know, what's the vitamin du jour? What's the vitamin for this month? Um, so I've been loyal to the Zia Vision products. So I Promise Restore, DVS, Easy Tears. And they're a St. Louis company. Um, their products, I think, are as good as anybody else's. And uh, if you're going to do that and you're going to stock vitamins, then you really have, it's a commitment to stock them. Um, we probably buy $2,000 wholesale of vitamins a month. And we make probably about a thousand dollars on that hmm. so it grows over the years i've been with that company since 2006 they don't do anything special for me or reward me in any special way uh i don't like the idea that they sell it on amazon but they do sell it the company will sell it to your patient if you want them to and you might get uh i don't know what is it, a dollar or something some nominal some nominal mm -hmm. amount uh you give them like a discount code so stocking yeah. product stocking products is it's difficult. Um, I'm no professional at managing inventory of products. Our, our EHRs just aren't set up like that. And I'm not going to have two different inventory systems. Um, but uh, we like to call it short cab rides. By the end of the year, you're like, holy moly, I sold $50,000 in just, you know, accessories and Steve random stuff. stuff. And it's all, it's gravy. And Solutions, vitamins. You get, you do get, work, keys, you know, you little, you do get worried because sometimes you feel like, wow, I'm, I'm sitting on all this, these goods and products and a lot of it has expiration dates. Um, but you just have to have confidence, especially when the front desk is presenting it. Uh, I'll give you an example. So when we do our dry eye workups, thorough, we go through their, you know, my biography, we're looking at tear breakup time and uh, their blepharitis and the patient gets to the front and they're ready to buy like hypochlorous acid. It's, you know, we want to sell it because we make the money, but your front desk has to believe in it because uh, right when they get to the front desk, that patient, their brain, it, it scrambles and oh, yeah. they forget everything. And so the front desk has to reiterate again after Dr. Brill went over it three times. And um, the staff. 
But if you put it all in a bag, you know, this is this is all that you need. They're, then they're confident. Say, okay, I got everything. I got my instructions. I got my IPL. I know what I'm supposed to do. I got my next appointment. And then we we always can have them call back. And some people some people call back, but um, surprisingly, all, people all those little small cab rides. Perry was talking about. It's an analogy, so they can you can go like one long cab ride from Kansas City to LA, or you can have a bunch of five mile ones. And all that little stuff starts, it does start adding up. And and it's nice to be one-stop shop. It's not for everyone. Some mm -hmm. people would rather just refer them to the website. Uh, but then you lose kind of control. They go to, yeah. well, I bought the one at Costco uh, or at Sam's Club or the cheapest one. Uh, and then you're not really doing any good because you're not really um, giving them the, what you feel the best products are. And you got to prove it. So we have Quantify, the instrument, the macular pigment optical density instrument. And when they go somewhere else and buy it, their, their, their uh, scores do not go up. And then when they switch, so I actually give them a guarantee. I like giving people a, a uh, what I call a risk reversal. I'll say, look, if you, if you buy six months worth of vitamins, and they don't have to buy it all at the same time, and we check it in six months, if your score doesn't go up, I'll just refund all your money on the six months worth of vitamins. Now, I'll tell you, I've never had to refer anybody. Right. So, uh, and nobody's ever asked, I want my money back on it. Because I think, okay, uh, why wouldn't you do that? You know, I like risk reversal on, on everything. And if they're not happy, you, you probably, I mean, it's okay. If they're not happy with your exam, I don't like refunding exam fees, but sometimes that's the nicest thing to get rid of patients, you know? You're like, okay, <laughs> done. And I don't yeah. do that too often, but once in a while, if you have a patient that is used to cheating other people or lying to you, you know, they hand you their crushed pair of glasses and, and say, no, this is the way I got them. And then little kid says, mom, no, that's, that's the one the truck rolled over, you know? So just be honest with us. I, I would say the key to the key to selling miscellaneous products within your practice um, is you have to have a retail center. Um, simply ours is behind the front desk. We have just nice shelving unit. Mm -hmm. We have a fully stocked product. Uh, my family were a family of grocers, my mom's side of the family. So uh, you have to line all your products up, make sure they're fully stocked. You know, don't just have one on the shelf because it just looks like, oh, that's that dusty yeah. one, you know? Yeah, you got to fill it up. Yeah. Yep. And then um, you got to make sure like you're really serious about it and the patients will come in. They come in every single month to buy it. It's it's quite amazing. It's part of, for the older people, it's part of their social experience. And I mm -hmm. learned that when my mom um, was uh, in her 80s and I said, well, I'm going to automate all your bills. And your bills. You never have to go to the post office. I've got your, I've got everything done. You won't have to go to the bank. You won't have to go to the post office. Um, you know, we can get your groceries delivered. But what I didn't realize after she watched her soap operas at four o'clock, she wanted to go to the grocery store and buy what she called interesting fruit. Okay. And then she'd see her travel agent and she'd see the bank. You know, it was like part of her existence and it made, it made meaning. And she'd go in the post office and talk. So, um, so we, you know, people do like to just come in. I mean, they like to mm -hmm. come in and chat a little bit and they, they know all the names and we know them. And so kind of like a little family atmosphere and you know, younger people uh, think, well, I just want everything shipped to me. I don't want to talk to anybody on the phone. I don't want to do anything. <laughs> Different but, mindset. You know, yeah. This more senior crowd and the older you get as an uh, OD, you get more older people. And of course that's where all the pathology is too. So, so, you know, we could easily sell them six bottles or 12 bottles, but they want to do one, one by one. So which is okay. We'll yeah, do it however yeah. they want to do it. Definitely. And I got one more thing to add to that before okay. we jump into the next question for us, we we've sold supplements as well. And actually I've gone directly to the manufacturer. If you look at a protein powder bottle, or if you look at a vitamin bottle, if you look in the really small print, it shows you where that product was manufactured. Private label is just the media, the middleman. And that's what I've done. You have to order in bulk but you can actually okay. private label it. You can call it whatever you want and you can design it however you want to. So that's how we've done it. Who do you it. go to for that? And uh, I've used Maker's Nutrition in the past. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're uh, basically just a huge distribution center out of New York. And they actually make some of the biggest protein powder companies uh, products. So, and then they just oh. send it out and then you can private label it. So it's another no option for powder. you. Yeah. You sell protein powder? I don't sell protein powder, but that's probably their biggest thing, but they also do all vitamins. So Yeah, yeah. so there is one major company that does make all the vitamins uh, for all the other companies too. Yeah. So, and, and, I, and I know that, but um, I, I was worried about that if we end up getting liability on it. 
So mm-hmm. how, what's the liability on that when it's got your name on it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing to consider, but I guess yeah. while we're on the topic of private label, um, I love private label. Number one, whether it's a private label spectacle lens, um, I'm not a fan of private label contacts because I feel like consumers, they kind of catch on to that. They're like, uh, this is not available on the internet and it doesn't Google. So mm-hmm. yeah. I'm skeptical. <laughs> uh, but no one's Googling what spectacle lenses they have. So yeah, I mean, team up with a laboratory who's, you know, this is a piece of plastic and it doesn't, it's not born with a name. It just, it has, you know, properties of physics and math and optics. So go to a lab and just ask for their private label lens. And these lenses are made by companies like Optotech out of Germany uh, and Dizen Optical Technologies out of Spain. And they have physicists there designing lenses. And then what happens is they sell those lenses to some other big company and they add marketing dollars to it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, one other thing we did recently is we actually formed a group of 20 optometrists and we all bought in and designed a frame line called DICE, D-I-I-C-E. And we know- we're going to keep that a secret, Perry. We're gonna What's that? that? We're going to keep that a secret. Yeah. Okay. So it's, you, it's yeah. something I want to do my whole, my whole life, say, I want to design my own frame line, specify the hinges, the metal in the, in the um, temples, and, and also the styles, uh, the colors, and all that. So Perry and I went to California and- we designed a frame line. So 20 different styles right now, uh, five different colors. And uh, yeah, we, we ordered 6,000 frames and we put in a um, $120,000 payment. So, or more than that, $180,000 payment. So I think what we learned in, in optometry is we can't rely on alliance groups and buying groups mm-hmm. and we have to just band together and it doesn't take many practices. I mean, we're buying a frame for $30 and we're going to sell it for 300 and it's oh, high maybe, quality. It's, it's going to be a little more. It'll, well, it'll, we got the tariffs and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Tariffs. You got other, other things yeah, now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Add, add to it in the case and all, but essentially we want to cut out that greedy middleman to quote a famous uh, uh, online and bricks and mortar uh, frame outlet. That's abbreviated WP. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we want to cut out the other greedy middle men and I'd say middle woman. Why not have middle woman too? Mm-hmm. So, so it's going to be fun. We're our, the fr- we'll get the prototypes in about four weeks and then it'll probably take another four or five months to actually have them made. And our mm-hmm. goal would be to have 25 to 30% of all the frames in my gallery, showroom, dispensary, whatever you want to call it. Uh, to be private label and high quality um, and with not my name on it, but with the DICE name on it. And I think that's going to help us be more, much more profitable. It's not for everyone. I mean, there's a lot of people that still want, I want to get all my uh, Luxottica frames and, um, and VSP frames. And I like it. The rep brings donuts and the other one brings candy. And uh, my staff likes it. And we want to use big E uh, lenses and pay $400 a job. So, you know, some people just can't get out of that groove mm-hmm. and they're, they're kind of in the way of their own progress. At least that's my, my thoughts, but we support the independence. And I think uh, just like you private label your vitamins, uh, we want to have not private label frames, but frames that are, that, you know, we had, we had involvement in, in designing and giving high quality, but, but we can have some profit in there too. We got to bring back the profit can't make profit on a lot of the eye care plans anymore. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, re- it's really sad. But as far as the frame companies go, a lot of them are just selling you really overpriced stuff. And they know they can get away with it. And you end up paying the sales rep and you pay for their marketing brochures they send you and their 2020 ads in the in the magazines. Um, so I, I, well, plus start- com- I, I know we we're supposed to talk about that a little bit later, but... Um- you know, we have competitors out there and they're not they are not helping us. You know, when they're buying 720 opticals, I don't see how that helps us. I mean, mm-hmm. so, uh, so we have to take charge of that. And I think whatever we can do, I mean, we, we obviously can't uh, negotiate together. We can't collude with pricing or anything like that. But I believe the vision care plans, are, they collude clearly. They have an organization of vision care plans and there's not that many of them. They know what each other does. So... 
So we have to watch out. We have to create our destiny. We we don't want to be the, the the sheep. You know, we'd rather be you know start our own flock, start you know be our own herder, and um, you know try not to be depressed by what's going on. So that's really what was the whole purpose of of entrepreneur. We we discovered that a lot of the doctors are just depressed. They are letting things happen to them, and you got to make it happen. If you if you want to do, you got to make it happen. Or or cooperate with others to make it happen. Kind of like you guys do on ODs on Finance. I mean, you got a fabulous uh, uh, site and all sorts of content. And, and I think it's fun when we could be participating in that. So, and I feel bad for the people that haven't discovered your site. So it's it's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your site as well. Fantastic content on there and always good podcasts. So, and let's see here. It looks like we got a couple more questions. And okay. And we're also going to have to have you guys on in a year so you can tell us about the dice update, see how that works in your optical. <laughs> so uh, Amanda Gillis says, uh, what are some ways to streamline check-in and check-out? That seems like a huge issue area in our practice. Have you gone paperless or know the first steps in doing so to automate and boost efficiency? I've got the tool for it. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a tech tech tool guy. Um, my, my, dad, my dad gets so mad because... <laughs> My dad gets so mad every month we sign up for some new subscription, you know, yeah, another no. monthly fee. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you do the same though, Dr. Newfeld. We try to limit it, but yeah, if we need yeah. it, we'll, we'll sign All right, up for so it. <laughs> I'll, I'll drop two tools. So we, a lot of people use Weave uh, for their phone communication systems, two-way texting, reminders. They have a new um, online form submission tool where uh, patients can fill out their history on a mobile friendly um, form. They can also take pictures of their insurance cards and driver's license, and you can get that um, so you can verify their insurance a lot easier. So you can reduce their time in the office. Uh, additionally, there's something called Curogram, C-U-R-O-G-R-A-M. Um, they don't do phones, but they have a similar system for checking in patients and getting all those forms to you. Uh, super simple, mobile friendly. So two tools for easy check-in. Okay, so, so I, might, and I might add something on there. You know, we put all the charges in, in the exam room. So we pre-appoint in the exam room. We do all the charges in the exam room. So that's one less thing for for the receptionist or fr your front desk person to, to worry about. And I, I try to keep them, as I mentioned, in the exam room as a patient as long as I can. So they're always amazed that they can essentially check out in the exam room, uh, but you know, but they have to walk up to the front and um, you know, kind of do all do it with the final payment there. So I don't know if we answered that question or not. Yeah, I think but you that, did. That, yeah. But that will help. That will help. Do, try mm -hmm. to do things in the exam room, and it's easier, especially for the pre-appoint. That pre-appoint at the front desk just does not work as well as mm -hmm. at you know in the exam room. All right, great. Well, let's move on to our second question here. Oh, All right. right, number one tweak or hack that you have seen become profitable in the exam room, and I'll, I'll steer that one towards Dr. Brill. Okay, uh, exam room hack. Okay, so there, um, I just mentioned the main thing is pre appointing the exam room. The other thing is that, you know, we have family members, and I know I'm not seeing the whole family. So when I'm not seeing the whole family, um, so let's say a mom brings in a kid. I'm like, well, do they have any brothers or sisters? Well, have we seen them? No, their eyes were okay. No, 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 we, we need to really see them. Then you have to educate them about the critical period of development. You have to educate them about amblyopia and then try to get them in. Now we do um, infancy. So if we get those free infancies, uh, you know, we try to see them somewhere between 10 and 12 months. And that sets the stage for when, I when they should come back. But I also try to get the parents in there. I mean, I, I need, actually, if you think about it clinically, we need to know their history, right? We need to know who's the high myope, who's got, um, you know, some, some hereditary disease that we don't know about, who's got keratoconus. So I found on infancy, though, they are not interested in that. So uh, they're like, okay, we're here and somehow somebody else is paying us. And, uh, and I ask them, well, who do you go see? And they're like, well, why would we ever come here? And I think, because I just spent a quality of an hour with your baby, you know, and I, and I do it out of passion. So I don't, I don't mind, but I think, you know, that thought that was supposed to be like a bonding experience. And, mm -hmm. 
and and then maybe get the uh, the parents here. But I realized don't expect that it's not going to happen. So I don't. Do you do infancy? Aaron? I do. Yeah, we don't see too many. Probably just a few a year. But um, okay. And and has that well. been a practice builder or not? You know, the, the few that have come, it's been hit or miss. So some of them just come for the free exam. You never see them again. Others have become lifelong patients. So it's really it's about right, fifty well, fifty though. But yeah, it's. It's not 100% by any means. They, so. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but if you ask for, uh, try to get, try to expand, you know, the, your appointment book by who you see. So if you just see the husband or the father, you know, well, where does your wife go? She needs a turn. You know, I mean, you have to show it that you really want to get the whole, the whole family in there. And, and then a lot of times they don't think, they think, well, I, I'm fine. Well, how do you know you're fine? They don't know if they have glaucoma or anything like that. You don't yeah. have to be aggressive about it, but sometimes they never think about it. Right. You know, and yeah. men don't make appointments. So women make, I think it's like 70% of all, all appointments there. So I think, uh, so that's a really low tech way to do it. I did a video on entrepreneur on, on actually how to do it. Uh, of course, uh, that hack, if you're not using a scribe, you really have to really get into that. And it's not hard to tr train somebody, just let them be with you. and. Gradually, they you will tell them exactly when when I go to the slit lamp, turn off the light, hand me the lens, you know. And it probably takes us three weeks to train uh, a scribe, someone that's tra trainable, um, and and it saves your saves a lot of time, especially if you're not spending a third of your time or half of your time typing mm -hmm. and looking away from the patient. Um, and they don't they don't really sense it that way, but they are going to their other doctors and are seeing the the bald spot on their male doctor's heads and the ponytail on their female doctor's heads, you know, and they're not, and, the, and, and doctors are not looking at the patient. I mean, you have to be paying attention to the patient, give them all your undivided attention. So I want to uh, say those, one, those hacks would be probably the key things. The only way to train a scribe is you have to have mornings off. You might have a month of no Wednesday mornings and you got to, role play it, go through the exercise. I know a lot of us are go, 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 go five, six days a week, but you'll be surprised. Just take that time off, sacrifice that money. And later on, you'll be like, wow, I feel good. I'm efficient now. Yeah, we do yeah. employee training on uh, Wednesday mornings. The staff needs time to catch up, you know, order mm -hmm. trials, or just keep everything in order, uh, do some more deep cleaning. So we've always had a little bit of time for them to catch up. Of course, that allows me to do some administrative stuff too. If you burn out your staff, I mean, it, it's just not good. Mm -hmm. So, um, and recently we went from seeing patients every Saturday to really just seeing them one Saturday a month. And, and that has increased morale quite a bit. Uh, and it's increased my morale a little bit too. So, yeah, those weekends can uh, be a killer. And I thought, well, the longest they'll wait is three weeks for, you know, for a Saturday. And that's, that's within reason. They don't go to their OBGYN on Saturday. They don't go to their dentist mm -hmm. on Saturday. Um, you know, you're just, so I think with COVID, it's allowed us to do things quite a bit differently, you know, change our schedule, change our, uh, our fee schedule. And it's kind of like a reset point. And hopefully everybody's taking advantage of that to do the things they want to do. And I kind of got the idea when Starbucks closed on Saturday and Sunday in my, in, uh, across the street from me, I thought, oh, they're closing Saturday and Sunday. So they've since opened, but they've all limited their hours. Mm -hmm. Even I belong to Lifetime Fitness, and it was 24 hours, but now they're like, nope, we're closing at nine. So, so I think it's, it's a good time to reassess all your processes and see what makes sense or what's a big headache for you. So working six days is a big headache because it's for scheduling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's great info. Next question. We pretty much already covered that one. So I'm going to skip that one. Uh, let's go to Perry for this one. Uh, number one tweaker hack that you've seen become profitable in the optical. So I want to consider this a hack. It's just more of a, a standard of, you know, in any retail business mm -hmm. is uh, I call it the default option. Um, you know, most in the managed care vision space, you know, we have a couple different antireflectives, whether we want to call it tier one and two and three or ABCD, you know, always start with the best because you can always go down and, um, and why not give the patient the best? You know, why, why would you say, well, you could get this one, but you know, it scratches easier. So start off, you know, really positive. And then, um, you know, when you're showing frames, start with the most expensive. So you show a $600 frame, a 400 and a 200, um, you know, that 
that 600 one's like, yeah, that's, that's kind of far out. The 200 is like, oh, that's cheap. You know, I don't want that. So it's pretty more likely someone's going to go for the $400 one. So the default option is just always offer the best and you can go down from there. Um, you also have to have a good sense of a gut feeling, you know, can somebody afford it or, or not? Um, so tell your staff. I assume, don't everybody, I assume everybody will afford it, but you, but you just can't go way overboard. I think what Perry's saying, you know, it's like, okay, um, you got to be somehow within reason and, and patients actually love it when you say, you know, this is, uh, I mean, you've got a really good quality frame, a good lenses. And, and for how you're going to use that, uh, we could, we could maybe economize a little bit by not going with this, you know, this type of AR or the polarized or who, who knows what, you know, just something. So they want to know that you're really on their side and you're not just always, um, you know, trying to gouge them for the highest price. So, or if there's two frames and you just say, and you're honest with them and say, well, I've got to tell you that this was like a hundred dollars cheaper, but I like it a lot better. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? And sometimes they know I want the more expensive one. So, mm. but you don't have surgeons ask you, well, do you want us to use, I got a, a little, some rustier tools in the back, but I don't know, I've got the new ones, but I, I could save a little bit if we just reuse those old ones. I'm just going to throw them away afterward. I mean, you would expect all your healthcare providers to do, to use the best of products. So, mm. um, and, what and, I and you should be thinking of them as treatment materials, not like, products you know it's it's a treatment so um, yeah you know I think if you have that attitude they'll have that attitude too you know what, what you presentation is everything whether you're presenting um scleral lenses ortho k or nice eyewear you have to be calm and confident so when you're picking out the glasses um i choose everything for people they don't even get a choice so when i'm a minus six myself so i would just say you're going to get a thin lens it's going to be scratch resistant, nice, lightweight, and here's the price. Um, I'll, I, I go at it a little more slow with the patient, but they want simplicity. They don't, don't mention names. The names, the French names and the Japanese ones are all very complicated. So just tell people the features and benefits and tell them the price. And sometimes there's that awkward phase of 10 seconds where nobody talks. That's a good thing. That means they're thinking. Thank you. And the so, next one that talks loses though. Right. So let someone think and just say the price once and they're, they're going to say yes or no. And um, that's when you can kind of choose your route next. You know? Perry, you should feed that. I was just going to say, <laughs> feed that dog. <laughs> I know he's going crazy. Or something, <laughs> will you? All right. Well, let's jump over. Uh, looks like we got a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, and actually okay. this one kind of goes with the next question. So uh, Justin Mays asked, best way to convert someone asking for a prescription and walking. Okay. So this is for the opticians. We always give the prescription, right? Everybody, you hand them the prescription even before they pay you or any obligation, but so, you know, that's not exactly right. But um, so for the optical offices and opticians, hey, we want to compete on, on, on a fair basis, but uh, we handle optical too. So I think don't, down, don't talk down anyone else um, unless they're doing a bad job for them. You know, I mean, I, I don't have a problem saying, look, you're on your plus four lens here, wherever you got it. And not, it's not staying in the frame. <laughs> okay, you have to have a frame that is a prop appropriate for the lens. So I, I, I think the key thing that I would do for somebody that says, I want to go, I want to go somewhere else and say, you know, that's fine. But with your prescription um, and with your permission, is it okay if, if I, or if your optician can just go through things that you need to look for? So especially let's say some easy things. Okay. It's your first time progressive. You do not want to get an aviator style or something with a harsh nasal cut on it. Um, so when you do that, it's going to, it's going to cut off your progressive lens or it's going to cut off your bifocal, whichever multi multifocal they have. So you, and, and I think for you, you'll want to have this type of shape. So you're just educating them, no obligation, just educating them. And that way you'll be a better consumer wherever you go. Okay. So we, we already know that a lot of times the first frame that you're going to pick to describe something, they may like it. And then there's a little dance. Okay. Well, I know you're going somewhere else. No, how much is that? I, I may want that. Well, no, you're going somewhere else. So let me get your prescription printed out. And I'm like, no, I think I want that. So it's a little bit of a fun dance. 
And in, in uh, optometry, we never really learned sales techniques and not sleazy sales techniques, but I would call it more um, psychology of the buyer. And then we, we in optometry should be the assistant buyer. We're not adversarial. We just want them to get a good pair of glasses. Of course, we want to sell them the glasses. But I think if, they're, if they have loyalty to, to a private optician, I that's fine. I think if they're, if they're going to the chains, I think that's fair competition to say, look, at, I think we do it better. I know we do it better. Here's, here, look at our, here's our lab. Look, we even invested in all this. It's not commoditized. You got to tell them this is not just a commodity. Yeah, and if you want them for six ninety six dollars and ninety five cents, we just can't compete with that. But we can buy those fifty cent no name Chinese frames all day long, and that's not meant to disparage China. But we can we can buy them all day long, and we can do inexpensive lenses. But then our reputation is based on high quality, and for you to return and refer others. If you have a problem with these glasses, you're never going to remember that you only wanted to pay $6.95, you're gonna remember you got crap from Brill, okay? So you have to be true to your own reputation. Um, hopefully they're coming to you because of your reputation and they're not coming to you because you're a Groupon person or you know just for their for something cheap. So I as think education is the way, education. Yeah, while we're on the topic of optical efficiency, um, I like to do, Generally, I'm a fan of outsourcing everything. Get rid of the, your insurance billing, your bookkeeping, your accounting. Uh, don't work at like a $20 an hour employee. You should be working at your full doctor wage if you're the doctor. So, uh, but for optical, you want to keep it in-house. So buy an edger. Um, I'm working with like four consulting clients right now, helping them buy an edger. Um, and right now, the, the financing programs are great for owning an edger. 0% interest for five years, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, the payments range anywhere from $300 to $600 a month for an edger. Uh, there's low maintenance. Um, it's like using an iPad. You just press a few buttons, and um, you got a beautiful lens that'll come out of your own office, and you'll deliver it to patients within 24 to 48 hours. And uh, sometimes we, we call our patients, and we're like, hey, your glasses are ready. Uh, but I thought it takes two weeks. No, no, we have, we, we made them. So they think it's too good to be true. You know, lens crafters got rid of all their labs that I know of. So yeah. for us to be oh, better, really? it, it doesn't take much. When they know, uh, it's one thing I want to talk about here is speed. Every, we're judged on speed. Did How quickly could they get us in for an appointment? How quickly did they make my glasses? Um it's not, we're not even based on our clinical skills anymore. It's just things that, that are a lot of times out of our control, but optical manufacturing is in our control. So if you don't have an edger, um, just realize that whatever your lab bill is, let's say you're spending $5,000 a, a year, a month on lab, slash your bill in half to 2,500. And that, that's profit going back in your pocket. Plus you have control. You know, I, I think people don't know what our capabilities are. And if you, you, you should stock some lenses, you have to decide what, what type of lenses you're going to stock. And Perry can help you on that um, in terms of like, do you want poly? Do you want a Hyvex lens? Do you need a high index? You know, and what, what range? But you, you're going to do well on it because the price of lenses, and we're talking high quality lenses, not seconds or thirds, is actually yeah. fairly inexpensive. You yeah, know, you can buy... Get, you can get your progressives down, what, Perry, to pair for 40 bucks or 60 bucks? Yeah, CR39 with a premium anti-reflective. You, you really shouldn't be paying, you should be paying between 40 to $80 for that lens cash. Um, a single vision CR39 lens should cost you about four to five bucks. And the, it's a pair. Beauty, it's a pair. a pair. And the beauty of buying stock lenses, there's less manufacturing defects. You know, just imagine when you're manufacturing things in bulk, you have a lot more control on quality. Um, you know, when you're like, if you bake cookies, I don't bake cookies. I like to eat cookies though. Um, if you bake cookies in different batches, you're, it's always going to be inconsistent. You burn this one, this one's too chewy. But when lenses are made, you know, by a million, millions and millions at a time, um, they just hold up better. Yeah, yeah so that, that's a commitment. And, but right now the edgers are pretty dummy proof. So I don't think I could do it, but I think you could probably have an eighth grader probably do it now. So I don't know. Uh, I, 
and the training is good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so we're, we're at the point now where, uh, you know, we don't worry about any watch keeping good time. I mean, people used to have to have an expensive watch to keep good time, but now all the watches are good. Really, all the phones are good, right? Mm -hmm. So just about everything electronic is reached a point. All the cameras are good. You know, either you're a Canon or you're a Nikon person, but they're good. So, and the edgers have really, uh, even those mid, mid range ones, maybe not the lowest end, but even the mid range ones, they're pretty darn good. Yeah, I would buy new. I would not buy a used edger. No, don't buy a used one, but mm -hmm. I, I would buy new, get all the latest software on it. And you'll, you'll feel more power. I think part of our, part of what, what doctors are depressed about is they don't have control. And I think I, I'm kind of a control freak or Al Kleinman told me that I'm kind of a control freak. So, so you want to have control over your practice. You want to know what's going on. When somebody calls up, I broke my glass. I need my RX to, to go to XYZ optical. Uh, and you're like, well, let me check. I have those lenses right in stock. Would it be okay? Would you mind? You know, it takes us about 15 yeah. minutes to make it. People, people come in with a corneal abrasion because uh, they've been wearing their contact lenses too long or something. And then they don't have they don't a backup. Have they don't yeah. have glasses. That's a great sale right there. They don't have glasses. And immediately they're in desperation mode. And you edge it on the spot. You go, you go back to your back room. It doesn't take a big space to have a stock of lenses. So, um, yeah. But take later on, you could say uh, they need something now. And maybe it's not perfect. But you say later on, you know, hey, not a problem. When, when everything's all healed, we'll double check it. And if we need, need to remake it, we'll just remake it. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's that risk reversal thing. Well, I don't know. I don't like glasses. I think, but you can't see. So you don't, you're, you're on the on the side of the road with a flat tire and no spare. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and they did it to themselves. Uh, but that you are there, you are the, the rescuing person yeah. and they will, don't remember that. So that that's something they will remember because they don't think you can actually do it. So a lot of times people leave because they don't think we can do something. I they want do. to talk yeah. about how, yeah. I want to talk about how taking control of your uh, in office lab can actually bring staff satisfaction. Staff leave our offices when they get bored. And so when you can give them more duties and more responsible roles, they feel like they're growing in the position. So lab is definitely one of those things. Um, and I know you're, you're big on lean theory. So if you, you can work on less opticians actually having an edger because you're, you're spending less time calling the lab. Where, is it, where did it ship? Did it break? Where the heck is it? Um, when you know it's in your office, you know, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this one, you know, right after lunch, or you mm -hmm. have some pro protocol. Yeah, it's because it does take a lot of time to, um, let's say, process the. You might have to do do things twice, you know, do it in your system, maybe do it on a managed care system, and then there's a lab system. So, you, God, for them to type that thing in there three times, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. Excellent. And then yeah. they gotta place the order, maybe confirm the order, follow the order. Then it comes in, check in the order, you know, by that time, uh, you really are not efficient. And mm -hmm. so it, it does help you to kind of take control of it. And of course, you got to make sure you, you process the jobs, uh, you know, in a timely fashion too. So, yeah. And looks like we got three follow-up questions on, on what we just okay. talked about. Uh, so Justin asked, uh, thoughts on stocking, having access to stock progressives? And then uh, Maria asked, do you recommend to buy stock lenses in bulk? And then Alina asked, uh, what Edger brand do you recommend? Okay, so you can, stock progressive lenses uh, don't exist. Yeah, but you'll have yeah. to order those custom, uh, just as you would, you know, like an RGP. And you'll get it in 24 to 48 hours, or um, just real quick. And it'll come, you know, in the prescription you need. So that's pretty easy. And then uh, the other question was, do you recommend to buy stock lenses in bulk? Um, yeah, like if you're new to edging, you don't necessarily need to buy stock lenses right away. Um, I know companies like ABB or you know WVA, you can actually uh, get your stock lenses included in your contact lens purchases and they ship in the same box. I, that's not really gonna work today because we're probably all sending contact lenses home though. Um, but yeah, what I recommend to do, Stock, like your whole goal is to fill maybe 80% of your orders in the office. You know, you're not going to fill your minus eight every day. So choose your core powers, maybe a Plano to like minus six up to two sill and a few materials. And for a small investment of, you know, 
three to ten thousand dollars, whatever you want to spend based on you know how many pairs. Um, that's stocking, and then Edger brands. So here's the thing on any piece of capital of equipment, you all the equipment's good. I'll tell you that. So Kia's good, a Hyundai's good, a Tesla's good. But really what you're buying is customer service. So you want someone who's going to answer the phone. They're not going to put you into a queue. They're going to call you right back. Um, so that's what you're buying when you're buying an Edger. And um, I've kind of had a love for Brio lately. They just seem to have good support and good service. And that's what it's about. All right, cool. Yeah, because you you need a partner in that then a whole lab thing. Mm -hmm. You need somebody that when you call, you're not gonna be like, oh yeah, I'll leave a message, we'll call you back in two days. Cause when you need something generally, you need something now. And yeah. if your edger breaks down, you got all sorts of jobs. It's, and they will all of them have some parts that go wrong or something, some little fuse or something easy. Most of the time nowadays they could just fix it online or or guide you through it or through a tutorial, or they can log into it. Uh, so that's way, way different than the, than the old days. Um, but we've always had, a, I've always had a lab. I, I don't know how to do any of those things, but I've always had a lab. And, and it was kind of fun to be able to actually craft things, you know, whether it's even tinting or, or anything. And, and you always have one employee that maybe isn't quite as good with the, with the patients, or maybe they're a little quieter but they love the lab, you know, just yeah, give, put me in the lab. Niche, so yeah. I'll, I'll adjust them. If, if you need me to talk to them, I, I can adjust their glasses, but they do just better in a lab. And maybe it's your, per, maybe it's the person that is just uh, maybe a, a little uh, not as presentable. I'm trying to be kind here. Maybe they are just don't have the personality for it, but you need technical people, you know, people can, that can fix the basic things on it and, and develop some skills. Uh, they, and it, the edging and that's a good way to, to move people around in the office. Edging companies will come out, they'll fly out, deliver the machine, set it up, calibrate it, and then they'll sit there for one to three days. And, and there's warranties. Yeah. In that time, you'll run your own jobs and you'll actually get the hands-on skills that you need. So you have a teacher, which is nice. All right, great. Yeah. And Looks like we got some comments here. So Justin May says, uh, stock progressives are done regularly from what I've been told. Offices share a warehouse storage facility that has the vast array of combinations versus ordering from, uh, and then that cuts off in some instances, a few states away. Um, Same day progressives happen in town here. So it's possible in some manner. You, so, they might be talking about, there's a company called Fast Grind. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's in-office surfacing. Uh, it's a whole different method of, of creating lenses. So uh, that's something that is available. You could possibly have a, a Plano with an progressive, couldn't you, Perry? Oh, you could. Yeah, but it's not ideal. I would just order your custom uncut and get it next day. That's next day. Yeah, that seems more reasonable. So I'm going to skip through a few of these questions. We're running a little bit low on time here. Okay. Uh, but I did want to get to this one because uh, you guys... We've done a great job with the whole uh, questionnaire that's been going out and the, the answers that have been coming in for uh, VS, not not just to name VSP, but just vision insurance in general and the oh, okay. changes we've been going through. So yeah, we don't. We'll, yeah, we'll just kind of refrain. Some commentary on yeah, vision. we're gonna kind of refrain from pointing fingers at anybody. Yeah, yeah but I don't know. Just a general commentary on what you guys so think. Generally, I'll I'll kind of tell everybody what uh, what we did is we we saw the news about the, that managed care plan. Uh, that's based in California. And uh, it was a little upsetting. And to see that we're being steered to use certain products, because as, as, as doctors and licensed opticians, uh, you know, everybody went through some type of schooling and they should be able to choose the best, the product they think is best for the patient. And so what we did is we had a survey and actually collected 1000 of them. Um, this is not a validated survey by any means. It was very biased and we got some really frank, honest thoughts from optometrists about what they think of managed care and how it affects the patient experience. So Most we, of we, we would not, we would not be able to repeat here. <laughs> and there was uh, a lot of, lot of F bombs. What? <laughs> there were a lot of foul language in there and some of us F this, F that. I mean, it was really, <laughs> they were funny, but, uh, but it was anonymous. So we don't know who did them. And uh, we just wanted to get a general consensus. I think on a thousand responses, you get a general consensus, okay? I mean, it's not like we said 50. 
and it, it and like Perry said, it wasn't validated, but um, we didn't have to really ask people if they, uh, how much they like it, you know, because we knew the general consensus was that people weren't going to like it because it's something restrictive. And it's kind of like, do you have any kids, Aaron? No, I don't have any kids yet. Okay. So, you know, when you punish your kids, I mean, you don't expect them to like it. Okay. And we were being slapped down and being punished. And here we are, all very loyal sheep, all very loyal sheep taking a pittance for uh, our examinations and haven't had a raise in what, 18, 19, 20 years. And we're taking it. We keep taking it. Our expenses all go up. And then to be squeezed into a mold that fits a verticalization of a managed care frame lab company. And there's a matter of fairness. You know, we have to be, we have to have some kind of fairness here. And I think some companies do not realize that, you know, we're humans here. We have to run practices, especially with the after COVID. You know, it would have been nice for some of these insurance companies or managed care companies to say, you know what? Thanks for hanging in there. We need you. You're you're great providers. We need you. Without I, you, we have no plan. I and heard we're you. gonna we're gonna bump your we're gonna give you 20% extra on all your reimbursement. And here's a ten thousand uh, dollar gift. We're matching. We're gonna kind of match a PPP or an EIDL. You know, we realize we're a billion dollar plus company, and you guys need a little help. The last thing we need is say we're gonna make it harder for you. To I, I so. heard uh, Davis Vision actually. Uh, I saw it on Facebook. I don't know if it's true, but they're giving out PPE uh, reimbursements or some type of subsidy. I saw that too. Yeah, <laughs> kind of cool. So I'll say, while we can't do anything in general to make an active move to, you know, abolish the the managed care environment, what we can do, and I suggest it to everybody, is start to disassociate with some of the products they sell. Um, you know. Oakley's a very good seller in our practice, and I'm not going to get rid of it because uh, it, it, it's just the environment we're in in Kansas City. We're the Midwest. It's not fashionable, and they do make some good uh, like sports lenses and stuff, but start to get rid of some of those frame brands. Don't, you know, if you're thinking about a EHR, you know, don't buy an EHR that uh, a managed care plan is selling. Um, so those are just my thoughts on choose who you do business with wisely. So I would say try to be as independent as you can. There's so many services that we can offer. Uh, I, I'm not a low vision or VT guy, but or gal, you know, if you're if you like that, maybe that's maybe that's the ticket for you to be less uh, less managed by managed care. Uh, I am a dry eye guy, so there's so much opportunity in dry eye, and I'm talking in more advanced treatments, not like I put them on Zydra or or Sequa or you know I gave them refresh sample. You know, do it in a more serious way after they've gone through that stage. I've, I've tried this, I've tried that. Try to do it a little bit more serious or, you know, uh, be a more collaborative optometry. So uh, I'm happy to refer to colleagues for things I don't do or don't do well or we're not on the insurance plan. I don't know why we refer to ophthalmologists for everything. You know, optometrists were trained in glaucoma to treat glaucoma. They've got an OCT, visual field. They have all the findings, but a lot of times I hear, I just want to refer it to the glaucoma specialist just to make sure like, okay, the pressures are 29. Their, their angles are closed. They, their sister has glaucoma. They're on steroids. They got glaucoma, you know, for you crying out loud, treat the glaucoma and, and gain some experience. So, but we refer out a lot of stuff to people that I, I think are not optometrists. And I, I like being the collaborative eye care model. I believe in it. Your patients believe in it. When a, when a general dentist, who does cleanings and fillings says, you know, you, you've got a gum problem. I have to send you to the periodontist. Well, of course you expect the periodontist not to do fillings, cleanings and, and steal the rest of the family. You expect them to be honest. Of course, we have to be that way too if, we're, if we are the person being referred to. So, but we need to grow up as a profession. I know people won't wanna hear it, but just gotta grow up. The patient will say, my doctor will do right by me no matter what. No one thinks a general dentist is stupid because they don't, they're not also a periodontist or an endodontist. They realize there are specialties. So yeah, we actually refer to somebody that really has a passion for dry eye or VT or low vision or whatever it is. Before COVID hit, um, Dr. Brill and myself, we prepared uh, a mailer we were going to send out to all the optometrists within three hours of us. And we're trying to actually court dry eye um, 
treatments, but mm. we're also part of the mailer was, it was called uh, the optometry's dirty little secret. And we went through the whole process of us referring to competitors. Let's keep this within the optometry realm. Uh, we don't do, we don't do low vision. So we're going to send that out and we need a, we need a network, a collaborative one and, and work together. So, um, yeah, if I you love these pleural lenses and they're a cone, say, look at, you know what, this is a little more specialized. I, I just don't really like it. I don't really do it, but I know this doctor that really loves that. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that they live, eat, breathe, think that. So, and we all have some, we can't do everything perfect. So let's be more collaborative. And I, I think that's a way that you're going to help grow the uh, unity in our profession. I think it's also a way for your patients to, to trust you more. So collaborative eye care, I mean, it's something we, we have to adopt. Uh, even ophthalmologists who hate other ophthalmologists will refer to that, that person because they're like, okay, look at, this is a complex, uh, let's say they have a, a, a dense cataracta complicata, the lens drops into the, into the posterior chamber, they're calling a retina specialist, okay? Mm -hmm. And a retina specialist sometimes said, you take it out. You know, I don't want to take it out. So, so, but, uh, and, and they don't want to do that, but they do what's best for the patient. So I think we never go wrong by just doing, and it sounds altruistic, but just do the best for the patients. They'll sense it if you're, if you're greedy, but if you're doing best for the patient, they'll always come back to you. So, uh, and that's really something I, I wish that our profession could mature a little bit on. So I agree there. Yeah. And then one last question before we wrap it up, uh, okay. Christy Larson asked, uh, do you get around having to run jobs through managed care labs and do 80% in-house? Or how do you get around having to run jobs through managed care labs and do 80% in-house? Yeah, well, um, yep, there's, actually a, quite, there's actually a number of states out there who have passed legislation that allows you to use your own laboratory. I'm, I'm in Kansas and we're one of them. Um, but a lot of the managed care plans have what's called an in-office finishing program. Well you'll sign a separate contract and they'll set you up on a, a higher reimbursement schedule for doing lenses uh, in-house, but it's very state specific. So you might yeah. want to check your, your manual. You'll actually get less money than, uh, than your chargeback. So I would think, Oh, just pay me what the chargeback is. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah, we're going to charge you less. I would uh, say Davis, we were able to opt out of the lab completely. We opted out of every single uh, managed care. I will say when you're, when you do have an edger, the place you order cash jobs from needs to be different from the one you order insurance jobs because they're at two different price points. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that makes sense. All right, cool. Well, I want to give you the four for just a couple minutes. If you want to just promote whatever's going on with iTrepreneur and everything else you got going on. So, well, we got a webinar away. coming up Thursday, I think Barry, don't we? Yeah, we're doing a website marketing webinar. Um, I'm a pretty blunt person, so we're going to call it like it is. Just optometrists and opticians are not, we're internet savvy, but we're not internet savvy in promoting our, our best services. So you might be the dry eye specialist or the ortho K guy or gal, but are you broadcasting that message to your community? And we're all looking for more cash business. And the only way you can get it is by promoting yourself online. Um, we like to go one to many. Uh, it, in office, we're, we're one to one, and that's the best. It's easier to close a sale. But if you can really write, you know, Dr. Newfield here is writing a ton of content about PPP, and I'm sure he's ranking on Google for something. Um, maybe it's optometrist PPP would be the, you know, the keyword when someone searches. My dog's going crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, so join the webinar and. Um, if you need help with anything in your office, I would love to come consult with you. And my whole thing is let's lower your cost of goods and, and increase your sales and set up your business for the future. And I would say that, you know, for some practices say, yeah, I know he says this, but that won't work in my office. I heard that all the time. And when, when I was, uh, after I spent four years in the army and a year in a, in a pediatric practice, what I did is I, I kind of listened. I listened to all the practice management experts and, and I incorporated, you know, I said, I'm going to, I learned that and I applied it. So, so we have an execution problem in optometry and it's common for small business. So I thought I'm going to steal everyone's idea because there's no original idea. I stole everyone's idea and I implemented it. And so you have to be open-minded to, to change. Now, sometimes 
you can't do it because you're not an expert in your own office, right? I mean, you got to at least be uh, someone from 50 miles away. So you're not an expert. So sometimes it does take uh, having a, um, either watching a, a, a webinar, additional training, or maybe having somebody uh, as a consultant in your office to uh, really kind of give a third party view. And usually if I go in an office, I could probably do the whole consultation with 10 minute observation, you know, cause you can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And the doctors uh, rarely walk to the front door, look, to see how, you know, how their office looks, uh, you know, the, all the contact lens companies and pharma companies and frame companies, they want to populate with all those crap brochures and posters. And it looks so crowded and it doesn't look good. So if you can't do that yourself, have somebody that you trust tell you your baby is ugly. And so we need to be told our baby's ugly and say, look, and I think a lot of it looks cluttered. It's got too much stuff. It's, you know, simplify it, make it, make it look nicer, make it clean. Of course. A lot of it's a timing thing. You know, do you want to spend three to five years going through the learning curve or do you want instant, instant results? Um, of course, it's going to take work and progress. So it's, you know, it's the reason I go to ODs on finance when I, I need something that's, that's technical. I'm looking for something digestible and quick. I'm not going to go to the government website for that. <laughs> I, I'm going to go to the experts within the field. So, yeah. And, and, and call your colleagues. I mean, and if you don't have, if you don't have a buddy, there's, there's ways for you to get the information. Uh, and nowadays there's so much content out there on, for training staff. Um, you know, tomorrow, I think we're having a early morning uh, ILUX training. And I've got a new extern from UMSL, uh, and I asked him to be to be in on that. So the, I think the more knowledgeable my staff is, the less I have to do or the less I have to know. And, the, and you have to, you can't just train. You got to retrain, retrain, uh, helps have lunches in there. Uh, and then eventually they know, they know all the stuff. I can say, look, at do you see anything else on the optimum? Hey, what about that little spot there? Oh, that's just a that's an artifact from, you know, you sprayed cleaner inside the Optimap. So, you know, so it's kind of fun. And, and they don't know that they're learning so much, but they really, they know a lot and they don't appreciate how much they know, but the more they know, they can answer those questions on the phone. Um, so I think we all have to keep learning. It, it's a continuous process. We're never done. Um, if you have the concept and as soon as you got your OD degree, you're, you have, you've been inoculated. Uh, I told my new extern, I said, uh, a month after you're out of school, you will already be obsolete. So you have to keep up. So yeah, look at the whole pile on. of journals you next, have next yeah. to your desk. And, uh, uh, you know, there's so much education online now. I, I wonder what we're going to be doing for like the academy meeting. So are we going to be having it? I know they're planning it in Nashville, but yeah, that's the question. I have yeah. no idea. Or uh, I think VSP isn't going to Vision, uh, Vision West. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'd like to book all my tickets for all the shows. I mean, I, so, but we don't know. And maybe we don't really need those big conferences. I, I love the Zoom webinars. Yeah, um, working well. yeah, but if you want, I would say anybody, if you want more content that's deeper topics, um, you can listen to our podcast. It's just Itrepreneur. Um, I'll spell it because it's the worst name ever. And I don't know why we decided on that. <laughs> I decided yeah. on that. E-Y-E-T-R-E-P-R-E-N-E-U-R. -E 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 Just search that on Spotify or Apple and you can listen to some deeper topics. But um, Dr. Well, Newfield, I want to thank you for YouTube. allowing us to be on here. Yeah, go ahead, Trey. Okay. okay, go ahead. Oh, you were saying- I was going to say we have videos, we have Zoom webinars, we have podcasts. Um, try, to put, try to put some genuine content out there and we're not copying everybody else. So that's what's our goal. Try to help people- run their practices better. And I thought I'm old enough, I'm gonna go ahead and just tell all the secrets because I know most people don't execute. So, you know, and, and, and the more successful all our colleagues are, the better we look as a profession. So mm -hmm. that's true in whatever mode of practice you're in. Yeah, that's very true. Well, thanks again, guys, for coming on. Yeah. Really enjoy your content and enjoy what you brought to the table tonight. So, and I think a lot of our members do as well. And Perry, if you can put your uh, the link to your webinar in the comments, I think a couple of people asked for that. That'd be great. Okay, yeah, we're actually, it's, it's something you guys are interested in. We're going to do a live critique of three people's websites. So if you don't mind us telling your baby's ugly, or maybe your baby's really beautiful, uh, we're going to pull someone's website up live, and we're going to point out things you're doing really well or things you could improve upon. 
and it would just be kind of a fun experience. We're doing um, it live. We're doing. We're gonna yeah, we're gonna Google them live and kind of go through their whole web presence. Oh boy, <laughs> so <laughs> that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, have your have a box of Kleenex ready, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a link in the in the notes. So sounds good. Cool. And then thanks. yeah, we'll have this in uh, YouTube and a podcast hopefully by tomorrow or the next day. So once again, guys, thanks for coming on. I know it's late out there, but appreciate it. All right. All right. Pleasure. Take care. Bye.